Amen, as God adds his blessings to the readings. When we're talking about heaven this morning, we're talking about, well, I want to go to heaven. And the thing that would keep me from going to heaven is sin. And so as we were on 1 Corinthians 6, Paul has had this same attitude with the church at Corinth. I want you to go to heaven. But there are some of you that won't let go of sin. Sin. Now, I want to be perfectly clear about this. You know, just like the preacher one time, the, the, the man went home and I was talking to his neighbor about church. And he's a man of few words. And so uh, the neighbor said, did you go to church this morning? He said, yep. He said, well, what did the preacher preach on? He said, sin. He said, well, what about it? He's against it. That's about it. You know, we're against sin. Because sin is wrong for us. It's just not that God said, well, I think I'll, uh, I know people like to do certain things. I'm just going to call that sin. Well, it's not that. It is sin hurts us. Sin hurts not only us. Sin hurts others that we're associated with. When he talks about sin and he talks about the, the leaven in the, the, about sin, sin hurts the church also. And so when we're talking about sin, we're talking about heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want everyone to go to heaven. And yet, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. What? Jesus, what do you mean? I thought everybody was going to heaven. Isn't that what you hear today? You go out and you survey people, you talk to 100 people, they, and you say, how many are going to heaven? Is everyone going to heaven? They say, yeah, everybody's going to heaven. Seems to be the prevalent attitude. God's not going to send anyone to hell. Right? We have a loving God. He's not going to send anyone to hell. Everybody's going to heaven. Jesus said, no, not everyone that says they're going to heaven is going to heaven. But he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Again, he says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, if you go up a few verses earlier, he said there's a straight gate, there's a, the narrow gate and the wide gate. They're on two roads. You're traveling the narrow road or the wide road. Now, is the wide road going to heaven? No. The narrow road is going to heaven. And few there be that find it. It is. Jesus said, not many are going to heaven. Well, why not? Jesus don't you love everyone? Jesus, didn't you die for everyone? What is going to keep people from going to heaven? And Paul said very plainly in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, if you would turn there, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Shall not, cannot, he's saying. Sin keeps us from heaven. Sin separates us from God. If you would turn to Isaiah chapter 59, Verses 1 and 2, and you're going to have that in your reading just shortly. When you go back to Isaiah, we're, we have several scriptures that we have read through Isaiah. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. He says, your sin, your iniquities, your sin separated you from God. God has done everything possible so that we can be one, that we can be reconciled with God, that we can be a child of God, but yet some people will not leave sin, will not separate themselves from sin. I looked up several statistics and I thought of this one particularly. We still have sin being accepted in society. Look at this. It says moral acceptability. And one is gay or lesbian relationships. Now, very specifically, in our reading today, those who are homosexuals are committing sin. I don't know how much plainer it can be said. 
And even though it is, and it's stated in the Bible, not everyone would say, well, I'm going to take the biblical view. They would say, I'm going to take the socially accepted view, where 59% are morally accepted. It is uh, promoted, accepted. Well, I'd say not only accepted, but promoted. I was looking through several uh, acceptances of homosexuality in our society, and you can look on the Internet on that, and, and I'll just give one example. In the University of Michigan, and along with several other colleges, this is just one, but our state universities are, are not only accepting but promoting homosexuality. The University of Mich Michigan has a course you can take. You get credit for it. How to be gay. They have another course you can take. It's homosexuality and the law. You get college credit for it. And they're, so they're, they're, they're promoting, well, now, if you're straight, you can come to this class and, and uh, learn to be a homosexual. And not only that, you can go and know your rights. Homosexuality and the law because that is being promoted so much in our society and in our laws. God said very plainly, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, it's a sin. Out of wedlock birth, 60%. That's, a, that's more and more prevalent today in our society than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago when I was in high school. Things have changed. Society has changed. Now, God hadn't changed, and sin has not changed, but society has, has accepted this sin. Sex outside of marriage. 63% say there's nothing wrong with sex outside of marriage. Nothing wrong. Who's it hurting? What's wrong with it? God said it's wrong. In the book of Hebrews, we can read the marriage bed is undefiled. It, it is special. It is unique. Within marriage, it is. And yet society would say, well, that's nothing wrong. 63% saying it's all right. 68% said divorce is all right. Socially acceptable. It's prevalent even in the church today. And it is. And it hurts families, and children, and the church. But it is socially acceptable. More and more, 68%. Polygamy, now 14%. We don't have polygamy being socially accepted at least by 2012. I don't know what they'd say now, 2016. It seems to be that's on the rise. Well, why not? If, if we, as a society, determine what is right or wrong or what, as far as uh, morals and sexuality, people would just say, well, uh, let's take a vote on this and see, well, is, is polygamy wrong or right? Is it accepted or not? And, and it will be on the rise in the future years. You just watch. He goes on to say in this, uh, this next slide some more, pornography. 31% said there's nothing wrong with pornography. The word pornography comes from our English word, our Greek word, well, English word, fornication. The Greek word is pornania. Fornication is translated from the word pornania, from which we will get the word pornography. It's becoming more and more prevalent, more and more accessible. It, it was when... Uh, when I was growing up, we didn't. It was more accessible. One is because of the internet. You know, there were. We always had ac access to it. If you want pornography, you can find it. Just some harder to find than others. When I was a teenager, and so, and it was a. You go to Seven Eleven stores, and you'd find pornography magazines there. You're kind of embarrassed to ask about them. Oh, I want. Uh, you know, but people did. 
And then there was the movement that it wasn't so accessible that you had to put a piece of cardboard over it at least. You, know, you had the comic session, you had, you had a good housekeeping, and you had pornography. But you had to put a cover over the pornography part. And now it is with the Internet and, and the computers and such that, uh, well, when we first got a computer, we had one computer in the living room. And so the whole family was on it. And that made more accountability to it. And then as more and more computers are available, uh, it seems like everyone in the household is having a computer. And so the, the kids at school have computers, and now they, they take the computers to their bedrooms, and, and it's private with it. Not only that, you have the, the iPhones and such. And the more private it is, the more accessible it is and the more socially acceptable pornography has become. People, people are losing their accountability. Accountability to society and accountability to family and accountability to God. Pornography is on the rise. It's, it has 31% uh, acceptability, but it's on the rise. And it's ruining our country and our nation. Abortion, 42% say it's socially acceptable. I thought that was pretty strange that 42%, I, I, it's not a majority. You know, we've been fighting this battle f for decades now with abortion. The arguments have been made back and forth, and now... I, I thought, I was really surprised. Only 42% of society said it's socially acceptable to have an abortion. But it's a sin. Teenage sex, 32%. Well, you're young. God made you this way. We can come up with all kinds of excuses. But now 32% say it's socially acceptable, even promoted. Unmarried women having a baby, 67%. We're talking about sexual sins, uh, in particularly. These are not the only sins that are spoken about in 1 Corinthians 6. But these are on the rise, I would say. When we talk about homosexuality as a sin... We talk about it more than others. You say, when, well, what about a, a drunkard? Isn't that a sin? Did, did he condemn that? It, yes, he does. Well, what about lying? Doesn't he condemn that? Yes, yes, he does. Well, what about gossiping? Is that a sin? Isn't that condemned? And, and yes, it is. Well, why are you so focused on homosexuality? And I'll tell you why. Because it's being promoted as not a sin. And that's the difference. People would say, well, lying is wrong, and lying is a sin. Gossiping is wrong, and gossiping is a sin. Drunkenness is wrong, and drunkenness is a sin. But when you talk about homosexuality, they're just saying, no, it's not a sin. I'm right on that. And that's when we talk about it. It's being promoted as socially acceptable and not a sin, saying the Bible doesn't talk about it. And you go to verses, and they would say, well, always an excuse. I'm not going to get into the excuses they have for it. We don't have time for that. I'll just say God said it's a sin. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. People would say, well, now, Jesus didn't talk about homosexuality. I beg your pardon, he did. He did not mention the word homosexuality. But he said in Matthew 19, marriage is one man and one woman. And when you say it's one man and one woman, you leave out everything else. It's not one man and a horse. You know, you look on the, I talk about the Internet, you look on the Internet, there are people getting married to animals now, horses and pigs and dogs and such, and cats. You say that's crazy, and it is. But if man determines what is right sexually, who's to say where it's going to be? If God's law is, is taken aside, and man determines what's right and wrong, well, man's just going to say, well, what's socially acceptable is what the most people will vote on. 
Sexual sin, she says. Flee fornication. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. Specifically forbidden. It is wrong. He continues in 1 Corinthians 6 talking about the leaven that continues to grow. And he's talking about if you don't put away sin out of your life. Remember Romans chapter 6? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, no, not in any way. When he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 11, he said, and such were some of you. Now let me say that again with a little bit of different emphasis. And such were some some of you. You had sin in your life and you stopped sinning for your own good, for the goods of those you love, for the good of the church, for the good of the nation, for the good of God's family. Put it away. It's against nature. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. It's not natural, the things that people are doing sexually. Sexual sins. Now, church, can I be any plainer about that? Woe unto them, Isaiah chapter 5 says, they call evil good and good evil. And we have that today. They're saying there's nothing wrong with sexual sins. There's nothing wrong with divorce. There's nothing wrong with fornication. There's nothing wrong with homosexuality. They're calling evil good and good evil. Now, what is our attitude toward that? Our attitude is, number one, it's been said like this, that we hate the sin and love the sinner. We hate the sin, but love the sinner. Sin has no part in the church, no part in our lives as Christians. I know we sin. I know we're not perfect. I know I'm talking to a group of people. We're not perfect. Do we sin? Yes, we sin. We lie or gossip, or cheat or steal or whatever. We, we sin. We're not perfect. But we strive not to sin, and that's the difference. We don't say, well, it's okay to sin. But God's going to forgive us. That's what Romans chapter 6 was about. Paul said, you put away sin. You don't continue in it. We hate the sin. God hates sin. Sin cost Jesus his life. It was because of sin Jesus shed his blood on the cross. He paid the ultimate sacrifice for sin so that you wouldn't have to. Hate the sin and love the sinner. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says, Preach the truth in love. Love the sinner. When I was looking up the images with homosexuality and such and I ran across this particular one, and I want to put this up here because it, it struck me wrong. For this little boy, says, GodHatesFags.com, and you can go to that website, and you can see God hates you. Let me tell you, church, what kind of message are we preaching when we say God hates you? No, God loves you. God so loved the world. And there are people in the world who are sinning. And one sin is not any worse than any other sin. Sin is sin. Jesus died for sin. And he loves you. Now, we are either going to, to drive some of, someone away from God or drive someone toward God with our attitude Particularly, I'll talk about homosexuality. We cannot put, God hates you. No, God loves you. God hates to sin. He does. We're the priests of truth and love. 
Love the sinner. Hate the sin. And let them know God loves them. And if they put away sin, they can go to heaven too. The next slide. Sin separates us from God. You could write Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 under there. All sin does. Every sin, small or great. Oh, we have small or great sins. Right? My sin is not as great as your sin. I just had a little sin. I just told a little lie. It's not a, I didn't kill anyone or anything like that. It's not a big sin. Jesus died on the cross for every sin. Sin separates you from God. Small or great. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And he lists several sins. And such were some of you. But you were washed. Have you been washed? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Isaiah again says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Have your sins been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Majority of us have. I saw Lauren and Paige baptized Friday night, washed in the blood of the Lamb. What a wonderful, wonderful rejoicing it is. We rejoice. Angels in heaven rejoice. But he said, but you are washed, but you are sanctified. Now, to be, to be sanctified means to be set apart. You're set apart from sin. You don't participate in sin any longer. Sin, you put that side of what you died to sin. You don't continue in it. And there were people in the church continuing in sin. And he said, put it away. Someone once said, don't lose heaven for the world. And what they're saying is, don't let sin keep you from heaven. Don't let it. It's not worth it. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We have two choices. If you're not a Christian, to become a Christian, to have your sins washed away. Begin again. Start anew. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. Old things are passed away. Those old things are the worldly things. The way you used to be. The sins that we had in our lives. We put those away. We stop it. And all things become new. Some are hard choices. To put away sin. Some struggle more than others. Our responsibility is to love them and pray for them. Encourage them through this struggle. God loves you. God loves every sinner. God died for you. Why don't you come right now as we stand and as we sing.